All right, time for another sermon request. And you probably already see where this one's going because you can see the title, so it kind of ruins the surprise of the thing. But uh, you might not have heard of this, so it might still be a surprise. But anyhow, I got this letter here and um, from a family in Pennsylvania, uh, which is my original state that I'm from. And I'm going to keep the name private because that's what I do. But it says here, uh, part of the letter, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it says, This letter is really a sermon study request. A friend's sister-in-law is being deceived by something. <clears throat> she says it's all over the Internet. Apparently it is so popular these days that Paul is a false apostle teacher. I tried to reason with this lady from Scripture. I never got any verses from her, needless to say. Her argument is that Acts 9 contradicts Galatians chapter 1 that the whole timeline of Paul's life and ministry doesn't add up. <clears throat> yes, it's all strange. She also claims that Paul contradicts Jesus' teachings and preaches a gospel of faith and works. I know it's all complete nonsense, but there is not reasoning with her. It goes back and forth. So my husband said, why don't you write to Brian about a sermon on Paul and the supposed controversy about his life? I found a lot of the Hebrew Roots Movement websites spreading this nonsense online. Well, if you think it's worth putting your time into it, great. If not, great. I'm sure there are other important sermons to do. Okay? So, I'm not going to read the rest of the letter there, but that's the main gist of it. So, I got this thing. This has been a little while ago. This was actually sent in July. So, it takes me a while sometimes to get to, around to doing a sermon. So, if you've requested, please be patient. But, uh, <clears throat> so I just kind of thought to myself, well, I have heard of some of this. I... I Looked into some of the Hebrew Roots cult movement stuff a little while, and it was like I heard this Paul's a usurper, and Paul is preaching something different. and I've heard some of that, but I didn't really realize how bad this thing is getting, and I didn't really realize who was really behind it. This is where it gets interesting. You see, because I looked into it, and it turns out the majority of these teachings are coming from Islam. The Muslims or as my wife likes to call them, Muslims, you know, because they're Muslim Catholics, so you just call them Muslims. Uh, the Muslims are the ones that are behind this movement. They're the ones that are denying this. And, it, and why? Because Paul is preaching Christ crucified. And see, they don't want that. They say, no, you have to go back under the law. You have to be justified by keeping the law, the Old Testament. See, because Islam does not reject the Old Testament. They reject the New Testament just like a lot of the Hebrew Roots Movement people do. A lot of the Hebrew Roots Movement, you have some people that just try to change Jesus' name from Jesus to Yeshua, you know, like that, and they try to get more Jewish, you know, customs and things like this. And, you know, I'm, I'm fine with studying Jewish customs and traditions and stuff, and I'm, of course, I'm not against the Hebrew language, but, you know, I think it's a bit hypocritical to go around saying Yeshua when the King James Bible says Jesus Christ. And if you've been saved out of the King James Bible, and you preach and teach from the King James Bible, I really think you ought to just stick with the plain English, you know, not try to Hebrew, make everything into Hebrew, especially when God chose Greek to write the New Testament. Just my opinion, you know. But the fact of the matter is, this whole agenda here, if you get really, really deep into the Hebrew Roots movement, they start to go back under the law, and they will start to reject Jesus, and they say, that it's, it's the form of Zeus. It's actually Jesus is a false god or something like this. And then they'll start to say, they won't say Yeshua, they'll say Yehoshua. You know, that's Joshua. You know, and I know that the root words of Jesus and you know, Yeshua and Yehoshua, it's the same kind of root word there. But the point is, God didn't write the New Testament in Hebrew. He wrote it in Greek. You know, well, I believe originally it was written in Hebrew. Okay, produce an original copy of the Hebrew New Testament, then we'll talk. All right, And it's the name of Jesus Christ, by the way, that has power, spiritual power. You say, prove it. Okay, I don't have to prove it. You can prove it for yourself. Go into a group of people, go into, out to a public store someplace and just say, I believe in Jesus Christ. And see the reaction. Go out, you say, I believe in Yeshua HaMashiach or whatever, you know. And see the reaction. Jesus Christ is the name that has power. If you deal with any kind of spiritual forces and you start throwing around the word Lord Jesus Christ, or even the name Jesus, you'll see the devil start to tremble. All right? But we're going to get into this study here. I'm going to play a video 
just to show you the kind of philosophy that's behind this. And I'm sure that you're going to just be like, what? You know, this is ridiculous. I mean, I, that's what I thought when I started to look into this. I thought maybe it's just a kind of a small movement or something, and I can just kind of look into it. And yeah, dumb. It's a pretty big movement. This whole Muslim uh, thing, Muslim, excuse me, <laughs> this whole Muslim thing of, of uh, you know, it's actually, you know, Paul is the Antichrist, and he's a false apostle and all this other stuff. Absolute total nonsense. But we're going to play the video here, and... I'm going to show you, you know, we're going to go through some of what they say here. So, I uh, guess that's it. Watch the video. The agenda of Paul. There were significant differences in the agenda of Jesus to that of Paul. One of the most important verses in the New Testament is Matthew 5.17. In 5.17, Jesus states why he is here. Matthew uh, 5, 17 through 19 says, uh, Don't think I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I came not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Uh, it would be easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for a jot or tittle to pass away from the law. The law that he is referring to is the Torah, which is the first five books of the Hebrew Bible and what Christians called the Old Testament. The Hebrew Bible and the prophets Jesus speaks of comprise the foundation of Judaism. Jesus is saying, think not that I have come to challenge Judaism, but to fulfill it. Jesus was a reformer. His mission was to bring the Jews back to the old ways of theology. He goes on to say, you change not a jot or a tittle in scripture. What does that mean? That, that means that a jot and a tittle are the little decorative squigglies that you put onto a Hebrew letter he says you don't change, a, he doesn't say you don't change a law, you don't change a, a philosophy or a thought or a paragraph or a word or even a letter. You don't change the tiniest little part of the law or the prophets. You change nothing. This is what he wanted to get back to that practice of, of, of what the scriptures say. Because Jesus is depicted as rebutting in advance Christian beliefs about what Jesus came to do. Paul says the exact opposite of Jesus. Paul could not convince Jews that Jesus was divine, so he went outside of Israel to the Gentiles. A Gentile is anyone who is not a Jew. And wasn't getting any place again uh, for two main reasons. Number one was the dietary law. He restricted the things that they enjoyed and ate oh, all the time. Wine, but the biggest the one was the circumcision law. In the first century or so, most all Christians were Jews. But Paul said you don't have to keep the Jewish law. That's a legalism and you're saved by the blood of Christ, not by keeping the Jewish law. So that he admitted Gentiles without circumcising them, without requiring them to observe Jewish dietary policies or going to the synagogue on Saturday. As a result, there developed what we call today two confessions or two denominations, Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. But it took a long time for that bifurcation to take place. A lot of the so-called Gentile Christian church were Jews, but they didn't continue observing Jewish practices, thanks to Paul. But the, the point that I'm making is that Jesus says, I'm here for this, and Paul says, I'm here for that. Jesus says, you change absolutely nothing, and, and he brings it to a, an extreme uh, degree. And Paul says, we don't have to obey those cursed laws. Jesus has freed us from them. Of course, that's not what Jesus said. Remember, the word apostle was reserved for those who were with Jesus and witnessed his doings. Paul claimed to be an apostle, and the Christian church calls him an apostle. Even though he was not involved or even knew Jesus, he had died long before Paul. Well, if you take uh, the conventional Christian Lutheran sort of a view of, of Paul, 
he is uh, a convert from Judaism to Christianity. Paul not only becomes a follower of the sect he persecuted, but imagines himself to be an apostle and an authority on Jesus. Out of nowhere, the guy says, you know, I'm not only a Christian, I'm an apostle. I'm on the level with the, the guys that Jesus actually taught. And uh, he, uh, however it happens, he doesn't say in the epistles, uh, the uh, stories in Acts of the Damascus Road are transparently borrowed from the conversions of uh, Pentheus and Euripides the Bacchae and uh, uh, Heliodorus in Second Maccabees chapter 3, well-known works of the time. But however it happened, he, he becomes a, uh, a Christian and decides that uh, the Torah is no longer binding that Jews uh, may keep it if they wish, but they're, they're grossly mistaken, even to the point of spiritual peril, if they think they must. Uh, he describes himself as being uh, born into the Jewish tradition, but he does not think we, we should follow the law as Christians. Uh, and he's being opposed there by Cephas, a lot of people say it's Peter, um, who was an actual disciple of Christ. Now in any argument, between Peter and Paul, guess who would have the advantage, right? It wouldn't be Paul, it would be Peter. Peter could say to Paul all the time, listen, uh, Paul, I was with Jesus. I was a friend of Jesus and you are an interloper. You, you've never even met the guy, right? Uh, so who are you to tell me what Jesus taught? I was there and you weren't. Uh, so it's in, actually interesting that this non-disciple of Jesus ended up being so dominant in early Christianity because, you know, he never met Jesus by his own account. Uh, everything he got, uh, he got from Revelation. How are we to verify that Jesus actually revealed anything to Paul? And clearly a lot of the early Christians did not agree with him. So Paul insists in Galatians that he was sent by the resurrected Christ and made the point, I'm as much sent as you are and if you knew Jesus before the crucifixion, that doesn't make a bit of difference. Everything is new now in 2 Corinthians. Now, this seems to be the tip of an iceberg, though, where he's trying to decide a larger issue. If these Gentiles who really like our new religion want to join but don't want to become Jews, uh, and this is very common. There were loads of Greeks and Romans going to the synagogue every Sabbath. And they said, this is great. This is better than the pagan garbage we were brought up with, these bed-hopping deities and so on. These people have a real uh, uh, faith here. But uh, to tell you the truth, I don't want to get circumcised. I don't want to stop having uh, shrimp cocktails and ham sandwiches. Uh, do you mind if I just attend and listen to the scripture and the sermons? And the Jews said, come on, no problem. Uh, you're not Jews, but that's all right. Well, that's the kind of issue facing Paul. I got these people lining up to, to be baptized as Christians. Do I have to tell them they've also got to be circumcised and no more ham sandwiches? Because if I do, they're going to leave. Uh, and it, can it be that important? This raised a huge problem with the Ebionites. They said, oh, look, I mean, uh, it may not be the most important thing, but Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. I mean, what, what's the last thing you think the Jewish Messiah is going to do? Is say, let's, let's just drop the Torah of Moses. We don't have no way. This is all right. It's the least of the commandments, but there's no way the Jewish Messiah is going to say that Jewish law is unimportant. So they said this Paul is an antichrist. He's a false apostle. He's a servant of the devil, especially the Ebionites. Oh, they really hated him. But Matthew did too. But remember what Jesus said, I keep saying, Matthew 5, 17, Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. And then he goes on, he says, you change nothing. So, critically, if somebody today wanted to be a true advocate of Jesus, he'd be a Jew. That's what Jesus was. If he wanted to be like Jesus, he'd be a Jew. Isn't that something? <laughs> Boy, I'm sure if you know the Bible well, you're going, okay, there's a lot of problems with that one. And uh, certainly there is. 
And I don't know if you noticed it or not, but the, the one guy, the kind of the chubby professor guy there that has the gray hair and the gr real nice trimmed gray beard, at one point in time, he's talking and he kind of goes like this and puts his hand up. And the guy's got this big old one ring. The one ring looks like it has runes on it. The other one has this big old skull. You know, this guy's an authority on the scriptures, you know. You, I mean, as you can see here in the picture, I mean, it's just like, okay. And you say, well, who is this guy? This Robert M. Price. Well, here we have Wikipedia. It says Robert McNair Price, born July 7th. I hate that. It has my birthday, you know. Horrible. But uh, July 7th, 1954, is an American theologian and writer. He teaches philosophy. What's the Bible say? Beware lest any man spoil, spoil you through philosophy. Hmm. He teaches philosophy and religion at the Johnny Coleman Theological Seminary. Is professor of biblical criticism at the Center for Inquiry Institute and the author of a number of books on theology and the historiosity of Jesus. Not the supernatural, you know, divine Jesus. God manifest in the flesh. No, no, no. Just the historical Jesus. Sure. Including, here's his books that he's written, Deconstructing Jesus, The Reason-Driven Life, you know, reason, atheism. Jesus is dead. Professor at a theological seminary wrote a book, Jesus is Dead, in 2007. In Inerrant the Wind, The Evangelical Crisis in Biblical Authority, 2009, The Case Against the Case for Christ, 2010, and the Ameri Amazing Colossal Apostle, The Search for the Historical Paul, 2012. Now check this next one out. A former Baptist minister, he was the editor of the Journal of Higher Criticism from 1994 until it ceased publication in 2003 and has extensively written about the whatever word there, a shared universe created by the writer H.P. Lovecraft. If you know anything about H.P. Lovecraft, he's the one that, that uh, made this modern day depiction of these aliens with a big head, the light bulb head and the big eyes. You know, he's the guy that was writing horror novels about that. You know, back in the Victorian times, he was an a old time horror novel writer. Guy was into the occult, messed up big time. And this guy's a big admirer of him. You know, and let me just say this before I go on. You see all this stuff? Biblical criticism, higher textual criticism. He teaches, you know, textual criticism and all this stuff. See, this is the result of Alexandrian textual criticism, the higher criticism where they start to get into naturalistic textual criticism. What is naturalistic? That is treating the Bible just like it's any other book, any other historical document. It's not supernatural in origin. It's just man-made. See? It's atheistic, in other words. And that's the only natural conclusion you can come to when you go off to some Bible seminary somewhere and your faith in the Word of God is destroyed. And then you come out and you say, I'm a Bible scholar and I'm a textual critic, but I don't believe in God. Just like this loser right here. Robert Price is a loser. And he's going to be a loser for all of eternity unless he gets out of this whole satanic system that he is in. He's going to burn in hell and scream. He's going to believe in God then, you know and the Lord Jesus Christ, which he doesn't right now. Price is a follower of the Jesus Seminar, a group of 150 writers and scholars who study the historiosity of Jesus, the organizer of a web community for those interested in the history, history of Christianity, and sits on the advisory board of the Secular Student Alliance. He is a religious skeptic, especially of Orthodox Christ, Christian beliefs, occasionally describing, describing himself as a Christian atheist. Yeah, oxymoron there. He is known in particular for his skepticism about the existence of Jesus as a historical figure, arguing in 2009 that Jesus may have existed, but unless someone discovers his diary or his skeleton, we'll never know. Uh, well, I know that Jesus existed. Why? Because I'm saved. You know? And again, all this stuff, these people, you know, come down on me all the time, you know, Oh, Brian Denner, you're, you're so stupid. It's, it's a simple belief and faith in, in Jesus Christ. Well, yeah, that's the mode of salvation. But how do you come to that point? If you haven't come to that point in a repentant state, in a broken, contrite state where you're saying, I'm a sinner. God be merciful to me, a sinner. And I'll believe whatever you tell me to believe. I don't understand how to clean up all my sins yet. I don't understand all the stuff of sanctification and everything else. But I'm here. I'm broken. I want to start over again. I want to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. 
See, that works, that works. Okay, then what is this? What is this loser right here? Robert Price. Don't you think he was a professing Christian back when he was a Baptist preacher? He teaches at a theological seminary. You see? These people make professions of faith. They get caught up in the emotion. They get caught up in all this, the hoopla of the Babel building. And they go in there and it's just like, I want to be a Christian now. And, and I want to go off to seminary and, and be a minister myself. I feel God calling me into the ministry. And he goes out and he's in ministry all these years and stuff. And then he becomes an atheist. And now he hates God. And he you know, writes against Jesus Christ. And that was the guy that you saw in the video too. Attacking the Apostle Paul. But he's a Christian because he said he was a Christian at one point in time and he was a Baptist minister. You see, that's where, where the whole argument is. All right? Real salvation produces a changed life. All right? I didn't say you have to change your life to become a Christian. All right? I'm saying when you become a Christian, you have a changed life. Things happen afterwards. Get that thing through your thick skulls out there, the people out there that claim that I teach work salvation. Real salvation produces a change. You don't produce a change to get really saved. You got that thing? I know some of you just can't seem to understand that. And I go over it and over it and over it with these people, and they don't ever, it doesn't sink through the skull there. You know? Sure wish people could understand that. If somebody's genuinely saved, there is a change. When you have somebody like this guy that's a Baptist minister and a professor at a theological seminary and everything else, and he hates God, and he doesn't believe in Jesus Christ, he never was saved. And I love it too. These people are like, oh, Brian Denler teaches work salvation, so he's a heretic and he's lost. And I said to one of these dumb nuts the one time, I said, okay, what should I do to get saved? He said, believe in Jesus Christ. I said, I do. <laughs> I already do believe in Jesus Christ. Well, then stop teaching work salvation. So in other words, I have to believe in Jesus and stop teaching a certain way. Wouldn't that be works? Uh, you know, <laughs> didn't think of that one. You know, I have to preach belief only and believe in Jesus Christ and then I'm truly saved. As long as I teach the new birth, a man must be born again, then that's works. Yeah. But anyhow, if you look up this... this uh, in the, if you watch this video on YouTube, the one we just watched here, and you look over in the sidebar, you'll see this other guy, and he's kind of a, an older man again, and he's got gray hair. And um, I forget what the video is called, but it basically says about how that um, proof that Paul is an apostle of Satan or something like this, I think. It's like over an hour long. And I have a picture here of that same guy. Here's a picture. I'll put it up on the screen. And he's burning a page from the Bible. And I checked out his channel. He's a theistic evolutionist. Another atheist. I mean, since when are we taking atheists seriously? These guys coming out and saying, if you compare the teachings of Paul with the teachings of Jesus, they don't line up. And therefore, you know, we can reject Paul, the Apostle Paul. He's a false prophet. You say, are you saved? Me? Oh, no, I'm an atheist. But, you know, I'm going to commentate, I'm going to be a commentator on the Bible, and I'm going to, I'm going to reason from the Scriptures why I'm right. What? And you're foolish enough to listen to these people out there if you're watching this, you know? And I don't mean the brother and sister that, you know, sent me the letter there. I'm talking about people out there that are falling for this nonsense, you know? Oh, I, I, I had, the truth was finally showed to me by people that are rejecting Jesus Christ. Okay, um, Muslims and atheists and Hebrew Roots Movement people are going to discern the scriptures. huh? That's a neat trick. I mean, somebody that doesn't even have Jesus Christ, doesn't even believe in Jesus Christ. And if you notice there in the video, it talked about that Jesus was a political figure. He was not divine thought that was interesting. You can go back and play it again. You can see it. it's right near the beginning there. Jesus was just political. He wasn't divine. You see? And over here in another picture I have this ridiculous man here. I'm going to try to be nice. And he's a Muslim. You know, Khalid Yassin. Why did Paul change the commandments of God? Birth of Christianity. And he's got this whole video, you know, and he's 
bringing up all these good points and everything. Like the Holy Spirit's going to show this loser anything. You know, and, and, and I'm, you know, I'm going to be a little bit rough again in this study because these people are coming out and openly denying the gospel. And, you know, it's like they're saying, you can't prove to me that you're saved. You say, well, actually, yes, I can, because let me just show you here in Scripture. Let's turn to the book of Romans. I don't believe in the book of Romans. It was written by a false apostle. Well, you know, can I tell you how to be saved? No, because I don't believe in that part of the Bible. That part of the Bible is not legitimate. Oh, well, I can show you that it is. No, because I reject those parts of the Bible, too. Hmm. <laughs> oh, okay, you know. And I'm going to show you today, too, by the way, we're going to go through these ridiculous assertions of these people and... I, or assertions, however you want to say it. You know, we're going to go through these, and, and I'm actually going to show you the ridiculous nonsense of this stuff. But here's a video of, you know, him. You can see the picture there. And then and this is another one I thought was funny. Here's a couple other videos. I just took a screenshot of the sidebar there, the other videos, related videos. And you have the same one that we watched there at the beginning. The Crucifixion by Khalid Yassin Fool. Uh should be F-O-O-L, but Khalid Yassin proofs from the Bible. You know, you're going to have a Muslim standing there telling you how to rightly divide the word of truth there in the New Testament. Sure. And I love this one, just to show how stupid this man is. 82% of the Bible written by Paul. Red letter Bible. 82% <laughs> of the Bible is written by Paul. What a fool. I mean, you got to be pretty stupid to make a statement like that. I mean, and people... Christians, you get a bunch of people that are professing Christians and they're going, oh, wow, really? People, read the Bible. Read it. Many of the books will tell you who it's written by. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. I wonder who wrote those books. It must have been Paul. No, or it could have been Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You know? They say, well, what about the book of Acts? Well, that would have been Luke, you know? And it's just like these people, oh, man, my faith is shaken because this Muslim came out and told me that Paul's a false apostle. If that's all the deeper your faith is there, friend, you got other problems. But we're going to just look at some ways to answer these fools, these Muslims and things. Uh, first of all, they say that Jesus fulfilled the law, or, you know, what about this thing of Jesus saying, I did not, didn't come to, you know, do away with the law and all this other stuff. Let's actually look at the scripture, Matthew chapter 5. There are a lot of cults that will take you to Matthew chapter 5, because dispensationally, it is, there's not one word about the blood atonement in the entire chapter. The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through chapter 7, those three chapters there, 5, 6, 7, that entire thing is the gospel for the kingdom. What is the kingdom? Jesus Christ came as the king. He offered the kingdom to the Jewish people, the millennial kingdom. They rejected it. But these things are going to come in in the millennial kingdom. You say, how do you know that? Matthew 5, verse 35, Nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. I've been over that thing many, many times. You know, um, where's the thing here? Uh, verse 14, Matthew 5, verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on an hill cannot be hid. Okay, now instruction in righteousness, yeah, it's, it's there. You know, we're like, you know, we bear the light of Jesus Christ. I understand that. But it's talking about a city here on the earth. What is the city? Jerusalem. All right? Understand that. So you get heretics, they'll, they'll jump across dispensational lines and they'll go to things for the millennial, millennial kingdom and they'll say, see, this is where we can get our doctrine because there's no blood atonement here. So, you know, we don't have to worry about that. So we'll just say the things that people are doing that are nice for each other and stuff like that, lending to people and turning the other cheek and, and all this other stuff. And we'll just pretend that that's the gospel for today. And what Jesus was saying there is what we're supposed to practice today. Uh, no, that doesn't work. But I'm going to show you that it goes even further than that. Because what Jesus is saying, he is not saying... I'm here to, I'm, I'm of the sect of the Essenes, and I'm, I'm going to be making everybody follow the laws and, and things like this to be saved, and, and you just have to continue following the laws. That's not at all what Jesus is saying. Him fulfilling the law has a totally different meaning than what these lost heretics are trying to get through to you.
But let's read here. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now again, if you saw the video, if you, that video at the beginning, they say, he's saying that you're not to change the law. You're not to be a transgressor of the law. You're not to change it. You're not to change one jot or one tittle. That's not what the Bible says, you bunch of liars. That's not what the Bible says. Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, sh tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. He's not saying don't change it. He's saying nothing's going to pass until everything is fulfilled. What is the fulfillment of the law? Us, by our own good works, I can keep the law. I'm a good person. I can go through life and keep the Ten Commandments perfectly. That's another joke with this whole thing. These Muslims, you know, these ridiculous fools, and they're going, you have to keep the law to be saved. And the Hebrew roots people, you have to keep the law to be saved. And these, well, I guess the Christ, Christian atheist guy, I guess he doesn't care about anything. He's just trying to destroy people's faith. I don't know what his lot is in the whole thing. But they're all going, you have to keep the law to be saved. You have to be a doer of the law. Really? You mean to tell me that all these Muslims out there have always kept the law? The Ten Commandments? What's that one about... Uh, Thou shalt not kill. The Muslims never disobey that one. Especially these new ones, these this ISIS thing, you know, where they're killing people and it, and even there's even cannibalism going on and stuff. Oh no, they don't kill. You know, how about uh, thou shalt not covet? How about that one? How about there, thou shalt not bear false witness? They're breaking that one in the videos. <laughs> they're lying like crazy. See, they pretend you have to go back to the law to be saved and to keep yourself saved. You're to be a doer of the law and the, and the Torah and all this other stuff. And yet they themselves couldn't keep it if their life depended on it. Nobody can. Jesus Christ is the only one that ever did. But these people, I mean, think about the underlying philosophy. The underlying satanic philosophy behind all things is what? Ye can be as gods, knowing good and evil. What does Satan always want to do? He wants to counterfeit God. What are these Muslims trying to do? What are these Hebrew roots people trying to do? The ones that really get into the far thing where they're going back under the law and all that? What are they trying to do? They're trying to be like Jesus Christ. That's exactly what they're trying to be. No man can keep the law except for Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only one that was ever live, able to live spotless. Ever able to live perfectly without sin. He was the only one that could ever keep the law. And that these, these Muslims and these Hebrew roots people are saying, you have to keep the law to be saved. Sure. So what was the thing about Jesus fulfilling the law? Luke chapter 24. Turn to Luke 24. Luke 24, verses 44 through 48. What was this thing about this? You know, you have to, I'm come to fulfill the law. All right, we'll read here. Luke chapter 24, verse 44. And by the way, these aren't the words of Paul. These are the words of Jesus. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem, and ye are witnesses of these things. Wait a second. These pathetic losers are saying, you have to keep the law to be saved. Jesus came, he was just trying to get people to go back to the Ten Commandments. His death on the cross wasn't legitimate. That just let's, let's get that nasty thing out of the way. You know why they're doing that? Because that was the fulfillment of the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law was written there to convict you of sin. I mean, 
Who can keep the Ten Commandments perfectly all their life, all their life without ever messing up once? You know, the Bible talks about if you, if you break one, you're, you're guilty of all. You know, who's able to do that? That's not the point of the Ten Commandments. The point of the Ten Commandments is to show you that you are a sinner and that you need a Savior who is perfect. You just read the words of Jesus right there in Luke chapter 24. You say, well, Paul's a, a, a wicked false apostle and, and he's, a, he's a heretic. Paul's not even saved yet. When that was written right there, when this is inspired, divinely inspired by God, Paul wasn't even known about. You see how these screwballs will get you away and they'll start to tell you, they'll drop these little, little things into, into professing Christians' minds and they'll say little seeds of doubt. You know, the Bible talks about the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able, ye shall be able to, um, yeah, ye shall, be, ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. What are the fiery darts? You know what they are? Here comes one. Paul's a false apostle. Here comes another one. Paul is the, is the false apostle in Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. There were no Pharisees that were saved. Jesus Christ preached a different gospel. You see? Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law and have you keep the law in order to be saved. And what happens is, these people that profess to be saved, they got their shield of faith up and they go like this and they bring it down and they say, really? And the devil goes and sticks one in. Oop, here comes another one. Uh, another one. Uh, and pretty soon they're they're like this and they're 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 on the battlefield and they're bleeding out and they're going, I guess, I guess the whole thing was a lie. I guess Christianity never was even true. I guess it's all been a scam. And I I believed a lie all this time and I gotta start acting like I'm Jewish and going back under the Ten Commandments and I gotta do all these things now to stay saved and keep myself saved and what they do? Lower their shield. Hmm. So you see it there in Luke chapter 24. Again, you know, one of these idiots comes along to you and they say, you know, Jesus, you know, didn't come, you know, the thing about him, he didn't come to do away with the law. We're supposed to keep the law to be saved. Luke chapter 24 verses 43, 44 through 48 is all you need. Take him right there. Show him. And by the way, notice in verse 47, Repentance and remission of sins. There's that nasty old repentance word again. You know? See it? And you say, well, then you're trying to teach two different things there. Well, it's two different things, but it's the same event. When you come to God and you say, I'm not going to be self-righteous anymore. I can't save myself. I can't keep the law. I can't keep the Ten Commandments to be saved. God, please, be merciful to me, a sinner. Repentance. And Lord, I'm going to put my faith in Jesus Christ because I know He's the only one that's perfect for salvation. He's the only one that can save my worthless hide. Remission of sins. One event. Two things, but it's the same event. You don't come to God and say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm useless. I know I'm worthless. I know I deserve to go to hell. I'll get back to you later about the other thing, God. Some other time, I'll, I'll come back. Why would you do that? You come to God, you say, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. I know it's only Jesus Christ that can save me. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. And it's interesting there, because you say, was Jesus preaching the same thing as Paul? Well, that depends on where you're looking at. You see, back in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, it's the Sermon on the Mount for the Millennial Kingdom. So no, they weren't preaching the same thing. So you've got to get the right divisions of Scripture. Then you have Jesus speaking to the Jewish people. And he's preparing them for the time of Jacob's trouble. Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 25. A lot of that stuff in there. Okay, it's before the crucifixion. And if you saw last week's sermon, that's why these guys don't understand it. That's why they're going, huh? But here after the crucifixion, Jesus is up from, you know, come up from the dead. And notice it says there, uh, Verse 46, thus it is written, and thus it behooves Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now we're going to read from the false apostle himself, the apostle Paul. <gasps> I know you're probably going to have nightmares from this tonight, but just, you know, let's try to get through it, okay? 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. These idiots are saying, Paul made it all up himself. He's, you know, he, Paul, you know, he's the false apostle. He made it all up. Oh, no, he didn't. He received it. See, lost people don't understand that. They can't understand the Holy Spirit speaking to you and giving you something. But it was given by revelation to Paul. You say, what's your proof? Let's read. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. What did we just read there in Luke chapter 24? Luke 24, and ye are witnesses of these things? You don't say. Jesus Christ and Paul preaching the same thing? Oh, but what about Matthew chapter 5? What about Matthew chapter 5? It's another dispensation. It's written to somebody else. What about Matthew chapter 24? He that shall endure to the end shall be saved. It's written to somebody else. Oh, the whole book is mine. The whole book is mine. People, if I can get one thing through to you, understand, well, two things. Number one, this is God's book. This is the authority. Number two, you must rightly divide it. It's not all written to you. I know that's so hard for some people to take. I know it's so difficult. But if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, if you refuse to rightly divide the word of truth, you will never understand the book. You will be going around and you'll be saying, well, how do I reconcile Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 24 and 1 Corinthians 15 and, and this and, and that? And how do I reconcile this stuff? I guess I'll just have to lie and just twist it and say it all teaches this or it all teaches that. And you'll be confused the rest of your life. If you really, truly want the Holy Spirit to guide you and teach you, He will teach you how to rightly divide the Word of Truth. And people say, you got it from Schofield and, and, uh, and Darby. I can tell you, I never read Schofield and I never read Darby. You say, well, then you got it from, from Clarence Larkin and Ruckman. Uh, well, I got some of it from Ruckman. He, you know, Lord showed me some of the truth through him and I read a little bit of Clarence Larkin's book right there down there. You know, I read a little bit of his, but uh, most of it's just the Lord showing me this stuff. Yeah. And, you know, I, I recommend, uh, I don't know if I have it here. It's on a bookshelf someplace. I'm not even sure where it's at, but Doug Stauffer, Dr. Doug Stauffer. I recommend his book on dispensational teaching. <sighs> a lot of books. <laughs> don't know where everything's at, but uh, let's continue. Okay. First thing, Jesus did fulfill the law, not by teaching people to keep the law to be saved, because he knows nobody can do that. Jesus fulfilled the law by being the perfect sacrifice to pay for sins. That's what he meant by fulfilling the law. Second thing, Jesus himself said that we are no longer under the law. See, that was another thing if you saw it in the video. They say, Jesus is cl clearly saying that people are supposed to keep the law to be saved, whereas Paul, this wicked apostle, he came along and he said, you don't have to keep the law. I'm going to show you that Jesus actually said this. Luke chapter 16, verse 16. Luke 16, verse 16. Jesus Christ speaking here. Paul is not the one writing this. Paul's not the one that recorded this. It says here, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. The law and the prophets are until John? Since that time the kingdom of God is preached? Hmm. You mean you don't have to keep the law anymore? Interesting. Next look at Luke 17, verse 20 and 21. You say, what about this kingdom of God thing, Brian? You know, that must be the law. Let's see what it is. Luke 17, verse 20 and 21. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is 
within you. Huh? A spiritual kingdom? And you know, I get I get in debates with these uh, non-dispensational Andersonites, and they say the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven is the same thing. Well, there are a couple of references where the kingdom of God can refer to the millennial physical kingdom of heaven. That is true. But the kingdom of heaven, Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, talks about the violent take it by force. How can you take the violent, how can you take the kingdom of heaven and make it into the kingdom of God as described right here? It's within you. The violent take it by force, really? Is there a war going on down here somehow with me and things like this? Oh, well, we'll just pervert the text and we'll just really tweak it and make it sound, you know, we'll just really... No, or you can actually just read it and believe it as it stands. See? The kingdom of God can refer to the kingdom of heaven, but the kingdom of heaven not once refers to a spiritual kingdom. Not once. Look up every reference. It's always a reference to the physical millennial kingdom that Jesus Christ is going to inherit. You say, well, the Jews, the Jews, they're wicked. They've been cast off. They, they're, they're, they're no more and everything else. And so it's all gone. It's not going to happen now. Oh, then Jesus Christ isn't going to get his inheritance, huh? You're going to steal that from him? No. He's going to get it. And it's going to be headquartered in Jerusalem, the physical city of Jerusalem. Real sorry. But you say, well, you know, this uh, teaching here, you know, this is the teaching of Jesus. That the kingdom of God is within you. This is Jesus' teaching, and certainly that false apostle Paul would not know about this. Turn to Romans chapter 14. We're going to see what our uh, false apostle here, Paul, what he has to say. Romans chapter 14, verse 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness peace, and joy. Is, are those physical things? No, those are spiritual. So when Jesus says the kingdom of God is within you, Paul comes out later and he says, it's righteousness, peace, and joy. Okay? It's not meat and drink. It's not physical, it's spiritual. Paul's preaching the same thing that Jesus Christ preached. Hmm. I wonder how that works out for these idiotic Muslims that are trying to say, well, you know, uh, Jesus was just a prophet. He wasn't really God manifest in the flesh. He really didn't die on the cross to pay for your sins. He's just a prophet. And he wants us all to live under the law. Yeah. Doesn't work. Turn next to Galatians chapter 5 in the Pauline epistles, you know. Galatians chapter 5, we're going to start here at uh, verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Question. Are those things that will cause you to lose your salvation? You say, absolutely. Really? Um, strife? Has there ever been strife among the brethren? Have you ever been into strife? How about emulation? In your younger years, did you ever lift somebody up on a pedestal and think that they're just perfect and without error? Did you lose your salvation? No. What's the kingdom of God there then? Spiritual fellowship. Or you could even make it the millennial kingdom. If you don't inherit the millennial kingdom, it's because you've been messing around with the flesh down here. You know, if you suffer, you also reign with him. If you don't suffer, you aren't going to reign. So you can make it either one there. Either, either one works out. Spiritual fellowship in this life is dependent upon you crucifying the flesh and putting the flesh down and, and having the fruit of the Spirit. The next two verses there, 22 and 23. Okay? So you can have spiritual fellowship or you can also say it's the millennial kingdom. Either one works there. But I wonder why a Muslim would not like these verses. I mean, why would you have a Muslim that comes along and says, 
I don't agree with the epistles of Paul. I don't, I don't like what Paul's saying. Maybe it's because it talks about uh, fornication, adultery, like having multiple wives, you know, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, like worshiping a false moon god called Allah, <laughs> witchcraft, hatred. Now that one, the, the Muslims, they don't have any hatred in them. They're the most loving people. You know, when they cut people's heads off, it's done in love. You know, they love everybody. <laughs> yeah, right. Drunkenness, revelings, and such like. That's why you get these wicked Muslims, and they come along and they go, I hate this New Testament. Ah, I hate this thing. Mm -hmm. Well, do you hate Jesus? Well, the Jesus that Paul preached, yes. They hate the Jesus like that, but they like the prophet Jesus. They like the Jesus of the Sermon on the Mount. You see. They just don't like the one that says that he died on the cross and that you have to become a new creature in Christ Jesus. You must be born again. They don't like that one. They don't like the one that comes back and says, hey, I'm going to rule and reign from Jerusalem and all you pagan people out there, all the false cults and religions, I'm going to cut off all of them things and everybody's going to come up to Jerusalem to worship the king. The Muslims don't like that guy. That's the Jesus that they don't want. But unfortunately for them, that's the Jesus that that's the uh, Jesus that's coming back. But anyhow, let's continue. Another thing that you can use, a third thing that you can use here is Paul didn't get rid of the law. He clarified what the law is used for. Again, you know, this lie that they said at the beginning of the thing here in the video, Paul was trying to turn people away from the law. No, he wasn't. Galatians chapter 3, verse 22 through 26 says here, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now think about something. If you get saved, according to this ridiculous Muslim nonsense, you know, you get saved according to that thing, and you say, I believe I put my faith in Jesus Christ, but now I have to keep the commandments in order to stay saved. You know, I have here a uh, another guy, just a lasttrumpet.org. This guy's name is uh, uh, da, 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 Douglas Nicholson. The guy can't even spell correctly. I mean, it, he's half illiterate here. And he's talking about uh, how do I get saved? Okay? Answering the question, how do you get saved? And um, he says here, Yeshua is our salvation. Takes two things to be saved. To believe on Him as your Lord and Savior, as the, only, as the true only Messiah of Israel, God in the flesh, and also to obey His word called Torah, Always to be Torah only observant of non rabbinic practices. And he says that the whole time it's cultic, you know. Non rabbinic practices. Non rabbinic practices. Yeah, sure. So what he's saying is you have to believe in Jesus Christ and you have to keep the law. Why? Didn't Jesus Christ pay for all your sins on the cross? What are you keeping the law for? Over here on this next page, he says, uh, what must I do to remain saved? Sure. <laughs> what must I do to remain saved? Well, you know, and he goes on to say about, you know, you have to keep the law. You have to stay in the Ten Commandments. You see, that is true work salvation. Not teaching that you have to have a new life, that you have to have a changed life after salvation. No, that's not teaching that. Okay, work salvation is saying you have to continually work at your salvation and at any time you stop working you're lost see that's what that whole thing is but look at uh, Galatians chapter 2 verse 16 it says here knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law but by the faith of Jesus Christ even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law now check this out for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Mm -hmm. Why do you think these Muslims hate Paul? 
Well, because by the works of the law there shall no flesh be justified. You're not going to be justified by keeping the Ten Commandments, by being Torah observant. Not going to happen. Now, another one of the big attacks, you can turn in your Bible to Acts chapter 15. Another one of the big attacks that they came up with in that video, and a lot of these heretics bring out, they'll say that Paul, you know, he just like took the early believers and he just stole them away, and he was like, you know, I'm going to form this new thing called Christianity. And all the other apostles are going, no, please don't, please don't. You know, the early Christians, you know, what, what was the name of the video? The Apostle Paul was the Antichrist according to the first Christians. What these losers said, you know. All the, the Apostle Paul, he was, he was a false prophet. And all the other apostles hated him, you know. Let's look about that. Acts chapter 15. Again, not written by Paul. It says here, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Sounds like the Muslims. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. I thought that Paul didn't care what the other apostles said. You know, that one guy in the video, he's like, He's like, you know, Paul and Peter would dispute. And I mean, Peter's like, who are you? You know, you, you never saw Jesus and I saw Jesus. And so who are you? Paul's just a false apostle. False apostle. He doesn't have any, any kind of merit or credit or anything. These guys don't even read the Bible. They can't even understand plain fifth grade English. Verse 3, And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were, were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which believed. There again, you know, this, these people are like, uh, you know, Paul was a Pharisee before he got saved, before his conversion. And so Jesus always disputed with the Pharisees and there was never any saved Pharisees. That proves again that Paul's false. Uh, right there it says that there were Pharisees that believed other than Paul. But anyhow, it says they were saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth, Peter, should hear the word of the, go hear the, word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying, purifying their hearts by following the Torah. Oh, wait a second there, it said by faith. That wicked false apostle Paul. You see how they hated Paul because he was the false apostle of Revelation 2 verse 2? Well, except for the fact that it was Peter that was saying this. Not Paul. Verse 10. And here's, here's where it really, you know, as they say, ties the rag on the bush, you know. This is what really gets their goat. Well, they are goats, actually, according to... Matthew chapter 25, but, you know, the Muslims. But let's read here. Verse 10. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of our, the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. What is the point of the Muslims and the Hebrew roots called us and these atheists and stuff? What is the point of them trying to take away the sacrificial death burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. They want to get you back under the law. And the law brings the yoke of bondage. So you can be controlled. You can be a slave. Slaves wear yokes. See? That's what they want. Why? The truth will make you free. Islam is not the truth. Hebrew Roots Movement is not the truth. Atheism is Certainly not the truth. What are they doing? Bring you back under bondage. Hold you in. You know, they tell you, be a free thinker. Be like the rest of us. <laughs> uh, excuse me? Be a free thinker with what? 
the foolish nonsense of evolution theory. There's no purpose to life. The strongest survive. Kill people if you want to. Whatever else, you know. Hey, hey, if there's undesirables out there, what's wrong with killing them? I mean, you know, there's nothing after this life. Most of you are never going to amount to anything. You know, as atheists out there, you're never going to amount to anything in life. Who cares? You know, you're just going to be losers all your life. It doesn't matter because you just go back to the dirt and uh, and that's freedom. You're a free thinker, are you? You can have your freedom if that's what it is. No, thank you. I'd rather accept the reality that this world is created and that the Creator's name is God and that He sent His Son to die on the cross to pay for my sins. And I'm going to go to heaven when I die. I'm free. You're still a slave. 